greet everybody again. If I have a chance to meet you, I'm Chip Freed, the lead teaching pastor here. Um, greetings to all of you who are with us online. That video broke my heart. That's an actual Google search. You can go do that. You know, just put letters of the alphabet in. Why are Christians so? And those are the words that come up. The one that broke me the most was with the U. Why are Christians so unlike Christ? Do you know the word Christian, the word church, get very, very negative reactions from the majority of American society. But the word Jesus still gets a positive reaction. At that name of Jesus, every knee shall bend, every tongue confess. That, but, but they're seeing a disconnect. We've been talking in this series about Faith Matters that 40 plus million people in our country who previously shared that they were, you know, involved uh, very much so in a church, in a synagogue, in a mosque, have left that in the last 25 to 30 years. Honey, Terry, my wife, I, I forgot my clicker. Dave Jezik's going to yell at me back there. If you can hand me off, thank you so much. I heard God say, it's fine. It's fine. You know, one of the old mystics said they heard God say, all is well. All is well. Um, but, you know, I've left church. St. God, come on. Do you know in 2000, 73% um, of Americans said that they were involved in a church, synagogue, or mosque. Today, that number has dropped to 45%. And, and you know, there's, something has happened. Something has happened that people have lost faith, have lost trust in religion. And I shared last week, if you were with us, that I don't think Christianity was a religion. The world had enough of those. Um, but the gospel was something very, very different. All religions had a religious founder that says, hey, here's the way to find God. Follow my teachings, you'll find God. Jesus showed up and said, don't follow my teachings, follow me. I'm not, I, I'm God come to find you. God is, is you know, r relentlessly pursuing God's people. And, and that's what we stand within. But something has happened that people have lost faith in faith communities. And what I'm contending in this series is the baby that's gotten thrown out with the bathwater, maybe we don't need religion, but my God, we certainly need faith. We need faith in something bigger than ourselves. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, everything in the world can be reduced to three things, faith, hope, and love. That those are the, the that's the Pythagorean's theorem of being human, of being uh, people created by God for God in the world, and we need faith. And so I've been saying, is there a faith? Is there something that we can live and breathe and represent in the world that would cause people, either who have left church or synagogue or, or never been there, to say, that's something I'll pay attention to? And last week, I talked about, you know, Jesus said the greatest commandment, loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. We looked at heart last week, a faith that loves radically. And today, I want to talk about a faith when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, a faith that doesn't check its brains in at the door, a faith that is rational. You know, I, I, I've been reading a lot of stuff in preparation for this series, stuff from Barna, stuff from Pew Research Company, people that, uh, you know, that social scientists that look at our nation and what people are thinking about faith and religion and God. I, I didn't know this group, PRRI, it's a Public Religious Research Institute. They did a survey just last year of people, of these folk, of 40 plus million, now they only surveyed 6,000 of them, but that's a sizable number, of people who said they were very involved in a faith community, but left it, and they asked them why. Do you know 67% stopped believing what their religion taught? 67%. 47% cited the church's negative teaching about the LGBTQ community. That's why they left. 
32%, this one hit me, said the church was bad for their mental health. That one hit me like a sledgehammer. 31% said sexual abuse um, scandals among clergy. And Catholics had a big number, but Protestants very equal to that. 30% 30 said the church's participation in polarizing politics led them to leave the church. Words that you'll hear out there today are something called deconstruction, where people are piece by piece, you know, taking apart the faith that they thought they believed in. There's a group that's growing in our country. It's called ex-evangelicals. I don't know if you've heard of that, ex-evangelicals. People who were raised in the evangelical faith that now feel ex-evangelical, they don't feel that the faith that's being demonstrated in the world is consistent with the one they see Jesus preaching about. So, so th th this is what's out there today, and I'm trying to say, what is a faith that we can incarnate, we can represent, that will make people pay attention so last week, a faith that loves radically today, a faith that loves God with all your mind, right? With, with, with who you are, with, with what you think. There was a, a, a seminary professor that really blessed my heart when I was there, and he wrote a book, and in his book, he dedicated it to some people. You know how people do that, writing a book. Um, I dedicated my dissertation recently to my wife, my teammate, but he dedicated his book to four people. He said, to my two Sunday school teachers, and he named them, who taught me that the grave was empty. And two of my seminary professors, and he named them, that taught me that my brain didn't have to be. <laughs> See, Jesus says to us, love the Lord your God with all your mind. If you know anything about cults or dynamics that are out there what do they do they try to train you what to listen to and what not to listen to they tell you what colleges you should attend or not attend they tell you what news outlets you should listen to or not listen to i mean we have to understand when jesus said love the lord your god with all your mind why did he teach him parables you ever wonder read read matthew 13 the disciples said, why do you teach us in parables? Why do you give us stories? Why don't you just give us ultimatums? He said, I teach in parables to force you deeper, to make you think, right? There was a statement in the Latin, I'm terrible at this, Eru eruditio et religio, right? That's Duke University, in case you don't know it, has it in their, in their um, uh, mantra, uh, Duke is, uh, I got some Dukies here. I know they, they hit me up last service. But this was founded by the Methodist Church. And it said, brain, thinking, knowledge, intellect with piety. That our brains and our, our piety go together. It's, it's vital to God that we hold those two things together. And Paul, I love in this Philippians, is praying for people's knowledge, for their discernment, for thinking. God wouldn't have given us brains if we weren't supposed to use them. If you ever study the intricacy of a brain, do you know the human brain weighs three pounds? But there's like five billion uh, neurocenters in the brain. It says they all branch off like trees that you can deduce that there are 500 trillion aspects to our brains. God gave us this so we would think. And I think too many churches preach that doubt, right? Doubt is the enemy of faith. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. You know, you don't even know you have faith until you doubt. You, you have to think through things. You have to question things. Mother Teresa, you know, after she died, they found out she was really struggling with some things. And one of the things she said is, someday God has a lot of explaining to do. We doubt, we wrestle. God is not offended by your doubt. We ask questions. We did a whole study, you know, if you were with us through Easter, that Jesus asked 307 questions. 
in the New Testament. You say, read the red letters. A lot of them are questions. And they weren't cut and dry questions. We learned in that series they were open-ended questions. Uh, counselors call them Socratic questions. They required thinking. They required wrestling. They were required th those kind of things. When I was raised in the church, I had Romans 8.28 stuffed down my nose. And it was preached to me very incorrectly, in my opinion. They would say, all things work together for good for they who love the Lord. Everything is God's reason and purpose. Just deal with it. That was really helpful for a teenager going through hell, by the way. Right? And I, it wasn't until I went to seminary that I found out that's not even what Paul wrote in Romans. He said, in all things, in all things, God is working for good on behalf of those who love him. God doesn't will it. God doesn't, you know, it's, it's our brokenness. It's our fallenness, uh, uh, the way we have broken the world. But in all that, God is working for good. God is doing something. It's not that he willed it in your life, that God is doing it. I was taught in Sunday school growing up, don't ask God why. That's what I was taught. Don't ever ask God why. And I've, taught, I've told you, when I went to Colgate University on a basketball scholarship, I was thrown out of my first two games for fighting. Second one, I went after a referee with a chair. Uh, you know, I had a chip, no pun intended, on my shoulder. I had a mountain. I was broken. I was a hurting kid. And I was told, don't ask God why. And thank God that university sent me to the college chaplain to put my life back together. And even though I fought him for our first five or six sessions, watch Goodwill Hunting. I was Matt Damon. And, and I fought him, and then finally he broke through the ice with me, and he said, well, tell me what you're thinking about God. And I said, I know I don't ask God why. He said, really, you're better than Jesus. Jesus asked God why. I said, show me. And he did. And you know what happened when he did? I stood up in his office. I called God every name I heard about in basketball locker rooms. I let him have it. And I found out that God loved me in the midst of that pain. God can handle your doubts. My, I went back. I, I, I keep a lot of our little marketing we used to do when, you know, 20 years ago when we tried to break the trend of Garfield declining and we started doing direct mailing. And, I, and my first Christmas here was uh, Christmas of uh, 2004. I came in September. We did a direct mail to the audience around us in Cleveland and, and we were talking about reactions to Christmas. And we put three reactions, the shepherds, uh, Joseph, the father of Jesus and Mary. And we said, faith, embarrassment, and joy. Do you know how many phone calls we got about embarrassment? Not from members of our church, greater community. I can't believe you guys are saying embarrassment, even though Rabbi Abraham Heschel said faith starts in embarrassment. When we look God in the, in the eye and realize that we've fallen so short. But see, we sanitize stuff. We, we don't want to believe that we can ask or we can seek or we can find. Didn't Jesus say something about that? Ask, search, knock. In fact, in the imperative Greek that it is, it says ask and keep on asking. Search and keep on searching. Knock and keep on knocking. God invites us to love him with our mind. The word in the Greek is the word dianoia. Dianoia, I'm sorry. Noia means brain or intellect. Dia means through. It means thinking through. In the Greek dictionaries of the Bible, it says that dianoia means critical thinking. How many times you've heard a sermon that says, love God with your critical thinking? <laughs> I've missed that one, right? But that's what Jesus invites us, you know, to, to think, to search, to seek. Um, I, there was a poll that was conducted by the BBC, and it surveyed the most hundred prominent physicists in the history of the world. You're better than me if you know this name, the person that came in third after Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein was a guy named James Clerk Maxwell. How many of y'all know him? 
Okay, we had one at Heritage that knew it. He's got like a PhD in, in, uh, in medical biology, so he's smarter than me. I never heard of him. Einstein, at the 100th anniversary of the birth of Maxwell, described him as the most profound and most fruitful physicist since the time of Isaac Newton. And he discovered all these things about the speed of light and, and showing visible light and radio waves, microwaves, x-rays. One person said he had the eureka moment in the history of physics. And when he discovered this, you know what his response was? This is a direct quote. The beauty of the natural world that I have observed and the fact that I could discover it at all filled me with wonder. And it gave credence to the idea that there is a creator who created the, and ordered the universe and created us so that we can inhabit it and explore it. This is one of the greatest minds. And his thinking did what? It led him to Christ. God gave us brains and meant for us to use them. I remember growing up in the 70s, I know millennials, you have to Google it, but it said the mind, UNCF, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. And there's so much wasting of our brains in the church. Somebody said to me, you know, I got my doctorate last year. I defended my dissertation in October. And I had some snarky, you know, 30-something pastor say to me, why did you wait to get to your doctorate until you're 61? I said, because I'm still learning. I'm still growing. You know what the most dangerous situation for a Christian is? When they think they've arrived. Whoever you think God is, he's more. He is exceedingly abundantly able to do more than you could ask or think. Paul said, this is Paul. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But when I grew up to be a man, I gave up my childish ways and I started seeking more. It's like looking into a dim mirror right now. I don't get everything, but one day I will fully know, even as I have been fully known. If you think you fully know, you are listening to the wrong voice. Because if you can paint God into a corner, your God is too small. Whatever you think God is, God's more. Somebody say more. more. He is more than I can. He said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. John Calvin, the founder of Presbyterianism and Calvinism, he said, God speaks to us the way we speak to infants with goo-goos and gagas. But one day, well, no. When my oldest sister was dying of cancer at 44 years of age, my middle sister and I were broken. We were hurting, dealing with that. And my sister Shirley, I hope you're listening today, Shirley, I love you. She ta told me a dream she had as a teenager, I think. She said, I had a dream, Chip, that one day we go to heaven and I was in heaven and it was a vast library, like the Library of Congress. And she said, one day we have so much more to learn. My, my son said to me, all these books I have as a minister through the years, she said, Dad, did you read all these books? I said, no, but one day. <laughs> one day, right? We have so much to learn. I, I, I was in a Bible study in my first church. It was a historically underserved community. It was in an urban environment, and I was doing a, a, a teaching series with the Baptist Church and the Methodist Church. I was doing a Bible study. We were together, and, and uh, you know, it wasn't a lot of um, us that were high, you know, degrees or whatever. And there was a woman named Lisa. I'll never forget. Lisa had been addicted to crack. She was uh, off and on the street in different times, and she was a valued member of this study. And I remember one time the issue of baptism came up. Did I tell you there were a lot of Baptists? in the group, and, uh, you know, came up, and he says, yeah, I think that some of you people think if you're not baptized, you can't be saved, and they all nod their head. She said, well, I'm just a common person, but, you know, when Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, I didn't read if they unnailed him <laughs> and brought him down and baptized him. You could have heard silence in that room. You know what Lisa was doing? She was loving the Lord, her God, with all her critical thinking. And I loved her for it. 
You know, God is not glorified. Hear me on this, friends. God is not glorified by ignorance. God is not glorified by bad or superficial theology. God is not glorified by nonsensical ideas and gullible followers. He never has been, and he never will be, right? Do you know PRRI, when I was reading them, they said that Christians, people that go to church regularly, are twice as likely to believe uh, conspiracy theories on social media than atheists or agnostics. Can you believe that? They're outthinking us. They're using their minds. MIT discovered in 2021, they went back and did a study. MIT, I mean, they're not dumb people. And they studied that 19 of the top 20 Christian social media sites are run by European troll bots because they know that Christians are susceptible to division done by Jesus memes. What, what have we done? We, we've, we've lost the ability to love God through our minds. That's why I love when Paul writes this prayer. You heard it read, right? This is my prayer, that your love might become even more and more rich. It literally means that your love would just overflow, break the banks with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so you will be able to decide what really matters, right? The majors, not the minors. And so you will be sincere and blameless on that day. You know what that word blameless means? It, and look at how Paul writes in Philippians, how much he's talking about our brain. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Finally, this is, I, I'm not making this up. This isn't Chip, this is Paul. Beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, right? Paul is thinking through his situation. Four times in Philippians, he says he's in chains. He's in prison, but he's not despairing. He's not bitter. He writes an epistle of joy. Why? Because he's thinking through. He's thinking through the glories of God, right? I, how do you write this? I, this one strikes me, Pastor Steve. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I've been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, to get a big paycheck, to run a big church, not sincerely, but intending to increase, right? What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way. Who talks like that if they're not thinking it through? And the word in the Greek is aproskopos, which means be a smooth road. Don't, as he says in Corinthians, do not cause anyone to stumble. That's Paul's thou shall not. Don't aproskopos. Don't cause others to stumble because you're not thinking, right? Because you're not. And when Paul thinks about the church, I'm going to flash three things to you in the six minutes I have left. When he thinks about the church, when he's really in his mind thinking, here's what he comes up with. He says, the church gives us an incomparable identity. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. When I travel on the road, I'm really ornery. When I go to a new church and they don't know me like you guys do, I get up and I say, hey, hello, saints. And they all shout, hello. Then I say, hello, sinners. It's real quiet. And I said, well, it's good to know we're all here. <laughs> See, saints doesn't mean what you think it means. We think saints as holy ones. I'm married to a saint, St. Teresa. She puts up with me. But we think saints are just, you know what holy means in the Bible? It means set apart. It means different. We're to call to be different. Paul says, well, you, you are all saints because you've been loved by God. You are here not because you're holding fast to God, but because God is holding fast to you. And that's why the church is always broken. 
And that's because broken people are who we say our, our vision, connecting diverse people who what? Share a common brokenness. We're all broken. You know, you know people who are broken act broken. People who are lost act lost. It's part of who we are. And that's why some people hate the church because they think its standards are, are not high enough. Right? We're supposed to be a museum of saints instead of a mash unit on the front line. But thank God Almighty for the mash unit on the front line that got my wounded behind into it when I needed it most. That's who we're called to be. That's who we are. And we have this incomparable identity that we are saints because God has so loved us. I read David Mickelson. He's the founder of Snopes.com. If you know Snopes.com, right, they fact check everything on the internet. See, I used to think if it was on the internet, it had to be true. And we found out that that's not the case. And Snopes does it, and he said it's hard for us to keep up with all the false stories. He said we are living in a post-truth age. And if you know anything about bilge pumps in a boat, I'm a boater, bilge pumps always pump out the water that could sink the boat you have to put on there. And this is what he said. He said, the bilge is coming faster than we can pump. All the lies, all the, all, all the fear of mongering, all the stuff is coming at us. But Paul says, you're a saint. You're a saint because you've been loved by God, not because you've earned it. And then he says that the church, here's why he stays with it. He's not part of the 40 million that love. He said it's a transformational community. I love this. He says in that introduction before those words we read, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. We don't bring things to completion, but God does. God goes all the way. He brings out in us, if we can hang in there in that community of faith that we are here today, uh, in spite of differences and everything else, that God will bring us better selves. He will bring something out of us we didn't even know we had. I was talking with a brother on this sermon. I had to call him. He is a dear friend. He, he, he was a member of Garfield for years before I came here. He's down south. Terry and I never go down I-77 south anywhere that we don't spend time with him and his wife. He is a dear friend. We don't agree on everything. We don't agree on politics or Cleveland sports or anything else. But we just love each other famously. And you know, the last time we had dinner, he always reminds me. He said, you know, when you first came to Garfield, I wasn't a fan. Your first three years there, I wasn't a fan. But here's what he said. I hung in there. And I found a lifelong friend that I would never have had if I didn't hang in there. Friends, we just got to hang in there together. We got to be in that place where God can transform us and bring to completion something in us that we never saw in ourselves. We, this is what Paul says in the transformational community. Do you understand Paul became a leader in a church whose relatives he had killed? But he hung in, yes. He hung in there. Friends, hang in there. Hang in there in that transformational community. And he says, I long for you with the compassion of Jesus Christ. Paul isn't talking about a love that overflows that's like a sappy feeling. It's a lumberjack with an ax. I'm going to hang in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with this thing. And somebody said to me one time, and this is theologically correct, they said, Chip, I'm just going to love the hell out of you. And I thank God that they did. You know, we need to be in this place. And then finally, Paul says, when he's thinking about what the church is, he found a project, a purpose, a mission, and a cause because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. Friends, if you look inward, it always shrinks you. But when you look outward and you seek to widen the circle, it expands you. You find out that you've been called, beckoned by the creator of the universe to be part of a project that's bigger than you. God help us when we retreat into our little safe lives. But Paul said, when I think about this, I've been called to something bigger than myself. I've been called to restore 
reconciliation, the proper order of things. Jesus has called us to this work, and we need to love God, not just with our heart. We'll talk about next week with our strength, but love God with our mind. God wouldn't have given us brains if we weren't supposed to use them, right? Think about these things, Paul said. And as he thought about it, he realized, my God, God has called me to something so much bigger than myself. Let me close with this. I read a story this past week. It was in the Toronto Sun. It was about a tour group that was in Iceland. I've never been to Iceland. Some of you may have been. But it was near the Elja Canyon, they called it. Um, and they, there was a group of tourists that spent hours on, on a Saturday night looking for a missing woman. The group was traveling through this area, right? The volcanic canyon in the Southern Highlands on Saturday afternoon. One of the women of the tour group left the bus to change her clothes and freshen up. When she came back to the bus, her bus mates didn't recognize her. So they put out a missing persons alert on her. Soon there was word throughout Iceland of a missing passenger. The woman didn't understand the description of herself, so she joined the search. <laughs> About 50 people searched the terrain by vehicles and on foot. The Coast Guard was called, a helicopter was dispatched, but the search finally was called off at 3 a.m when it became clear the missing woman was in fact accounted for and searching for herself. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. Because if you don't, you end up searching for yourself. Jesus said those who lose themselves for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find out who they truly are. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of thinking, feeling, experiencing. God, don't let us cave into the father of lies. That's who you say that Satan is. He's just the father of lies. He's the prince of the spirit of the air. God, let us not be just driven to and fro by every wind that comes along. But let us think. Let us reflect whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is good, whatever is pure. God, help us think about these things and tie them down, anchor them in our lives so we don't become part of a search party that's looking for ourselves. When you say, come unto me, all you who are laboring and thinking and dreading, and I'll give you rest, I'll give you peace for your souls, I'll tell you who you are. Lord God, help us to hear that. We are your beloved children in whom you are well pleased. Let us think about that in Jesus' name. Amen.